Hey, it's me, Dust Modi, and welcome to the Wizard's Lair Item Shop. Let's see, August, September, October. Three months ago, I participated in a readathon and I bit off more than I could chew. Did I read all the books? No. I did read most of them, though. But then came the realization that I would have to talk about every single book I read. But. I got so overwhelmed and so burnt out from reading so much and I just like I I sat and I thought I was like how do I even start this video I read over 9,000 over 9,000 pages how do I how do I talk about that <laughs> and so I decided fuck it no no script I don't really have notes I'm just going off of the uh, chat log from d my um, reading server in the discord link down below if you want to join i do talk about books there um as well as like other stuff I, i'm probably going to limit this video to actually only talking about one book the first book that i read for the readathon this asshole i hate this book so much i hate this i hate this book so much why are you like this why are you like this this book the Name of the Wind by Patrick Rothfuss. Ugh. I don't know why I started with this one for the redesign. It is way longer than it needs to be. And I hated it. But I couldn't DNF it. I could, I could have DNF'd it. But there was something about it that intrigued me. Because I was like, why? Why is it so bad? Why do I hate it? So What's wrong with it? What's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? I don't know. What's wrong with me? Why did I read this book? I also just felt majorly betrayed by this book because I hated it right off the bat, but it was recommended to me by so many people. So many people told me this was a good book. I feel so betrayed. I, ca I can't trust anyone. I can't trust anyone. Who likes this? Why? Explain why. What was what was good about it? What was good about this book? I am genuinely curious. No offense. You're allowed to like this book. We're allowed to have different opinions. I just want to know why. My very first impression of this book from, from my notes is, Oh God, I hate Name of the Wind so much. From the start, I thought the main character seemed like the kind of guy that a certain kind of man would think was like the epitome of a cool guy. Then like 50 pages in the book switches to being first person. I'm like, cool self insert Sigma male OC. And it is so obvious from the beginning to red flag number one. If you're supposed to think that a, a male character, specifically like a white man is supposed to be cool in like a book is if his room is described as like monk like. Like, he, he's a minimalist. <laughs> he's one of those YouTubers who only owns one shirt. The magic system in the name of the wind is literally just a white man saying, you just gotta want it. And I hate it here. The book's title is is sort of like a, um, a reference to the magic system in which, like, there are names for things, like, like secret <laughs> hidden names. And when you know them, you can, like, uh like command them i guess is sort of how that that works um which is so fucking lame my friend responded the magic system is an old white man saying if you pull your yourself up by your bootstraps you'll make magic so for me because the character was not relatable at all and i also just didn't like him he kind of came across as like weirdly disingenuine especially because um, like I said, the book is in first person for like the majority of it. Um, and it's like he's trying to convince you that he's like super cool and powerful, but it's like, why should I believe you? The other kind of like annoying thing about like how this works too is like that the book, so the format that the book is written in is that the main character is telling you like his life story and he's trying, well, or at least it comes across he's trying very hard to give into that he's very cool very powerful very important uh and that by extension that the book itself is also very like important and stuff like that and so it just feels very weird like 
like Patrick Rothfuss is like, like he's telling me that it's a good book, but I'm like reading it and I'm like, where? So Cloth is our main character and he is telling his story chronologically. And so we start off with him as a child and he's sort of like in a traveling band of like entertainers, I guess is the way you could put it. We're introduced to his parents right off the bat and they're all like, they're kind of over the top loving parents like everyone's just a little bit too nice and endearing and you fucking know they're all gonna die you just you know no chance buddy you're trying too hard to make me like these characters just spoon feeding me that these are good characters they're not i know that you you want me to like them because you're gonna kill them i'm not stupid I think that's my main problem with the book and, and this author too, is that he like, right? Like, it's like he assumes his reader is fucking stupid. Buddy. Quoth feels like a self-insert character, but Quoth's dad also feels like a self-insert character. And so there's this weird Oedipus thing going on. <laughs> like, it, it's it's uncomfortable, okay? Like, he... he Quoth is a little bit too aware that his mom is hot. It's it's not it's not good. I, I it, it's weird. It's just weird, okay? And they're really gross and like all over all over each other. Um, and then I'm just like reading this and I'm like, when are they gonna die? I I'm sick of this. Kill them already. And then when they do finally die, I was just like, yes. Finally, I never have to deal with these characters ever again. So early on, there's this passage that um, is sort of the first of, of many like repeated instances of this thing happening. The book is 600 pages of mansplaining in a fantasy setting. I just... Anyway, the passage goes, Perhaps the greatest faculty our minds possess is the ability to cope with pain. Classic thinking teaches us of the four doors of the mind, which everyone moves through according to their need. First is the door of sleep. Sleep offers us a retreat from the world and all its pain. Sleep marks passing time, giving us distance from things that have hurt us. When a person is wounded, they will often fall unconscious. Similarly, someone who hears traumatic news will often swoon or faint. This is the mind's way of protecting itself from pain by stepping through the first door. Second is the door of forgetting. Some wounds are too deep to heal or too deep to heal quickly. In addition, many memories are simply painful and there is no healing to be done. The saying, time heals all wounds is false. Time heals most wounds, the rest are hidden behind this door. Third is the door of madness. There are times when the mind is dealt such a blow it hides itself in insanity. While this may not seem beneficial, it is. There are times when reality is nothing but pain, and to escape that pain, the mind must leave reality behind. Last is the door of death, the final resort. Nothing can hurt us after we are dead. Or so we have been told. Um, there's a lot of, like, things that make me uncomfortable about, like, the way he's laying out, um, like how how people cope with trauma and thing is like it's not 100 percent inaccurate the way that he's explaining it but it, it feels off and it feels like an outsider perspective i don't know how to explain it um like if 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 he had laid all these things out and then we had or like not even all at once like in in chunks like if this passage had been like split up into three pieces and scattered throughout this like character arc where both is like dealing with his trauma and stuff like that and like processing like the death of his family like maybe it wouldn't have felt so weird but we we genuinely we don't see that um and i think that's like it's like the most basic writing advice ever is like show don't tell like i feel like he's telling us how coping with trauma and then he's showing us something very different um which is basically close running around being a little street urchin for like a few years or whatever um he doesn't have shoes that's a reoccurring thing for him i don't know why if i had a nickel for every time this man didn't have shoes I'd have like a dollar or something. I don't know. It's like a reoccurring thing. And I do not know why Quoth 
like con consistently always loses his shoes. It's honestly, it's weird. <laughs> One of my friends responded to this passage saying it feels too matter of fact for how whimsical he lays everything out. Um, and another person uh, compared it to like how like old timey people used to describe like hysteria uh, or like female hysteria specifically, you know. <laughs> oh, God, I literally can't with name of the wind, though. This asshole is writing about disabled people now. And, like, I'm pretty sure the focus is going to be on the guy who takes care of them being such a good guy, even though literally the introduction to these characters is close, initi initially assuming they're all being tortured because they're literally tied down to their beds. Oh, also, I guess the term disabled isn't fantasy enough, so he just calls them hopeless. There is, <laughs> within, uh... Both little like trauma recovery arc um, when he's like being a street urchin or whatever, he does encounter some disabled people, and it's implied like a um, a priest who takes care of them, or like maybe he's not a priest anymore. He used to be a priest, um, but the the priest may also be to some extent disabled, or at least it's kind of implied that uh, these characters serve no purpose other than to make both more humble <laughs> like that is the only reason why they're there like it's just to their their scenery to make everything look worse it's horrible disability rep it's really it, it's upsetting it like it's sad they don't get any kind of resolution um they're only there because like to look sad basically that's the only reason why they're there so the series does have a, um, within its world building, does have like a major religion where um, Helu is like sort of their Jesus or their God. I don't know. I guess he's kind of more like Jesus. Um, <laughs> but when, when we finally get to the passage where like they're, the world building happens and they're like explaining like the lore of the religion or whatever. <laughs> Kalu is basically Jesus, but he converts people by beating the shit out of them. I'm not, I'm not fucking with you. Like, <laughs> there's this passage. Then Kalu stepped back and saw, and Canis shifted again. And Canis is like a, a demon or something. He's like evil. He's the bad guy or the devil or whatever. As if disturbed by an unpleasant dream. Then he shook and came awake entirely, and Canis strained against the chains, his body arching upwards as he pulled against them. Where the iron touched his skin, it felt like knives and needles and nails, like the searing pain of frost, like the sting of a hundred bite biting flies. And Canis thrashed on the wheel and began to howl as the iron burned and bit and froze him. To Talu, the sound was like a sweet music. He lay down on the ground beside the wheel and slept a day, a deep sleep, for he was very tired. Like, what the f Like, it kind of goes hard, but also, like, what? That's crazy. <laughs> like, literally, right before this, he's going around to different people and straight up just telling them, there are two paths. Both lead to death. Both hold pain and punish it. But I, and I'm on one of the paths. And then he makes them choose. And regardless of what they choose, he beats the shit out of them with a fucking hammer. I shit you not. So at some point in this book, I started to like kind of mentally keep track of every time, uh, every time I thought that Quoth was lying to us or embellishing or altering the truth. Um, and there is this one passage. You have to be a bit of a liar to tell a story the right way. Too much truth confuses the facts and too much honesty makes it sound insincere. I feel like I've read better unreliable narrators, but it's not extremely evident that Kof is supposed to be an unreliable narrator. And by the end, um, because this book does keep switching back to third person periodically, um, and we get to see like other characters like engaging in the lore outside of Kof's telling of his life story, they're all backing him up. Like they're all kind of reaffirming that like that he's not lying it's weird like i i genuinely i don't understand whether or not we're supposed to believe him and it's not enjoyable 
there's a lot of like men writing women shit in this book too um like from I, the way Cloth describes his mom and he's like super hot for his mom there's also a courtesan that is like part of his um like troop that he travels with like his his family or whatever um and and so he he makes even though he's like yeah i respect hoes it's kind of like weirdly objectifying and like uh give me a gold star and a cookie and a pat on the back for being chill with uh prostitutes <laughs> there's also like and again it's it's weird it's weirdly like self-congratulatory because it like this this scene that i'm about to read is like really sexist but um like the person being sexist is supposed to be the bad guy so it's like i don't know it, like it, again it's just it's all meant to make quotes look better and it's just weird anyway the the context for this is that um both is now like at a university essentially and um He's in a class and a female classmate enters the class late, okay? Um, and the teacher is kind of a, a dick, right? Sorry, miss. She was the only woman in the room. Poor manners on my part. What is your name? Rhea. Rhea, is that short for Rianne? Yes, it is, she smiled. Rianne, would you please cross your legs? The request made with such an earnest tone that not even a titter escaped the class. Looking puzzled, Rianne crossed her legs. Now that the gates of hell are closed, Ham said in his normal, rougher tones, we can begin. And so he did, ignoring her for the rest of the lecture, which, as I see it, was an inadvertent kindness. Oh, God. And then there's this, uh, there's this part where, um, quote, kind of like, uh, kind of embarrasses this asshole teacher. Uh, <laughs> and, and it ends with everyone clapping. I'm, I'm not joking. It ends with everyone, and then everyone claps. At this point, I use one of the tricks of the stage. There is a certain inflection of voice and body language that signals a crowd to applaud. I cannot explain how exactly it is done, but it had its intended effect. I nodded my head to them and turned to face him amidst, amidst applause, which, though far from deafening, was probably more than he had ever received. And then everyone clapped. He really does talk to us like we are aliens and like we don't understand anything. There are a lot of points in the story where both does things or things happen around him and nobody is around to like corroborate these things or that they happened in such a way. Um, and I like, like my head canon is that they didn't happen. For example, uh, throughout the book, uh, both runs into his love interests, uh, Dina, Dena, Diana. She has like a billion names. They all have a billion names. It's infuriating. And he keeps like running into her and it's like supposed to be like fate or whatever, like coincidence. My head canon is that he's stalking her and that it, it is 100% intentional that he keeps reappearing in her life um he does a lot of creepy shit to her too like um there's this one part this is after uh quotes like saves someone for the first time uh it takes place during the the university arc he's he saves this girl from this accident right he's in like a like a common room or something like that um eating uh as i ate my finely tuned eavesdropper's ears picked out pieces of the stories people were telling it's only then hearing it from other people that I realized that I, what I had done. I was used to people talking about me, as I've said. I had been actively building a reputation for myself. This was different. This was real. People were already embroidering the details and confusing parts. But the heart of the story was still there. I had saved Fella, rushed into the fire, carried her to safety, just like Prince Gallant out of some storybook. It was my first taste of being a hero. I found it quite to my liking. So he doesn't like the fact that he saved her. He likes the fact that people are talking about that he saved her, right? Oh God, more evidence that Denna is being stalked. She finds you at Anchors. She comes to get you that night at Eolian when you're we're drinking. She makes up an excuse to wander in the middle of nowhere with you for a couple of days. So basically this is his friend talking about how the girl is like, she, she keeps popping up and they keep hanging out, right? Sim, I said, exasperated. 
If she was interested, I'd be able to find her more than once in a month of searching. Of searching! Hmm. That's a logical fallacy. Another thing I should note is that all the men in this book are debate perverts. Uh, they really like uh, to, to point out like logical fallacies and shit like that. They love that shit. Sim pointed out eagerly. False cause. False cause. All that proves is that you're lousy at finding her or that she's hard to find. Not that she's not interested. I hate men. I hate men. In fact, Willem pointed out, taking up Simon's side, since she finds you more often, it seems like likely. It seems likely that she must spend a fair amount of time looking for you. Oh god, the delusion. You're not easy to track down. That indicates interest. I I hate it. In the way that he describes Denna, this is one part. Her eyes were dark, dark as chocolate, dark as coffee, dark as the polished wood of my father's loot. They were set in a fair face, oval like a teardrop. Both stopped suddenly, as if he had run himself out of words. The silence was so sudden and deep that Chronicle er, glanced briefly up from his page, something he had not done before. But even as Chronicle er, looked up, another flood of words burst out of both. Her easy smile could stop a man's heart. Her lips were red. Not the garish painted red so many women believe makes them desirable. Her lips were always red, morning and night, as if minutes before you saw her she had been eating sweet berries or drinking heart's blood. And then he kind of like trails off and he's kind of like unsatisfied with like any way of like describing her. Um, and then so, like his, his apprentice, Bast, is interjects and he just says, she had a crooked nose. What the fuck? There's also this part where Denna is telling Koth that she's going to learn how to play the lyre and he like basically shits on her and says that like the half harp is like a better instrument and like just just gate gatekeeping shit man just typical don't even get me started on the dragon in this story okay because of course it's a fantasy don't I, I hope you didn't forget that it's a fantasy story because there is a dragon there is a dragon. I had the pleasure of reading the first like 100 pages of the Priory of the Orange Tree around the same time of reading Name of the Wind. I never finished Priory of the Orange Tree. It's still on my TBR. I just didn't get around to it. Priory of the Orange Tree does dragons well. Like the dragons are like kind of like a little bit too sentient. Like they're kind of like smart and like majestic and like terrifying and like whoa like they're kind of like like god status right um <laughs> the dragon in the name of the wind is a big lizard the big lizard with a big dumb lizard brain breathes fire uh that's about it it can't fly it's it's very chonky he's a very chonky boy which like that what I'm describing sounds like it could be endearing, right? Like a, a big chonky lizard man. Who doesn't want that? Like he's dumb. That sounds cute. Um, the dragon also is addicted to drugs. He dies from an overdose. <laughs> or I think they like murder him. I'm not entirely sure. They might have squished him with like a the iron wheel thing. I don't remember. It was very forgettable. I'm sorry. Um, but the main takeaway is that Quoth is a dickhead to animals and wildlife. And that uh, the dragon deserved to live. One of the weird things that happened, uh, because I read this book first in in my readathon, uh, and I hated it so much, and it left such like a negative impression on me, I started comparing it to all of the other books I read after it. <laughs> like all of them. And it, it made it kind of like even harder to pin down what exactly is wrong with this book i think really what it comes down to is that quote is not a likable character and that's it like i thought that i didn't like that it was in first person but then i read uh assassin's apprentice and that is also in first person uh and i really liked that i uh, and then i thought oh maybe it's not that it's like in first person it's that it's uh the format is that like it's first person um, who's telling a story like maybe that's just not for me right uh but then i read interview with a vampire 
and that's that's the format of that it's it's literally an interview with a vampire it is the story of, of i can't remember his name who's the main one in the first book is it louis it's the format for the book and then i thought like uh you know maybe maybe this character has too much like uh, <laughs> mansplaining in it too much men too much man you know uh, then I read a uh, picture of Dorian Gray and like that, it didn't bother me there. Um, I thought maybe, maybe like it's the unreliable like narrator that like really wasn't doing it for me. And then I read Bunny and Bunny has a, a good example of an unreliable narrator. When you read Bunny uh, by, I think it's by uh, Mona Awad, uh, her book Bunny. When you read it, the entire time, you don't know if something like supernatural is happening, if something drug related is happening, or if something mental illness related is happening. Like it could be all of those at once. You don't know. You don't know if the main character is lying to you or hallucinating or what. Um, that is a good, like they handled unreliable narrator good in that instance. And I didn't even like Bunny that much overall. I just think that that aspect of the book was done well. Another weird like similarity between this book and Assassin's Apprentice is that um, characters have like multiple names, um, especially the main character. And I feel like that's another example of how like it, it falls apart. It makes the story harder to follow in The Name of the Wind. It makes it more confusing. Um, like when Denna is first introduced and then when she's like reintroduced, it took me like a while to realize that that was supposed to be the same character. Like it was not immediately obvious, but uh, like Assassin's Apprentice, not only do they handle it um, a lot better, but it's also more thematically relevant to the story, which is weird to say because like the book, the name of the wind is literally the name of the wind. The magic system is literally like names. Like that's why I, I assume that's why all the characters, like it's a big deal what name they're referred to and how they're called um, in, in the story. But like it it doesn't add anything. Whereas in Assassin's Apprentice, like it it makes sense. Like our, our main character, um, I guess name, what's, what, what's his main name? Rick? <laughs> um he like he, he doesn't have much of like his own identity so it makes sense that he would be called like a bunch of different things like he doesn't have like a, his own name because he he's like abandoned and he doesn't have like parents and stuff like that and like he picks up names as he like develops his character and stuff like that names are also like relevant in that context because of like court life i guess um court intrigue is like thematically relevant in that book also it's not annoying like the fact that him and also other characters too have multiple names that they go by throughout the story um like it, it doesn't make it any more difficult to follow um because it, it's very consistent like uh if a character has a name for a certain other character they only refer to them as that one and in like the main character's like per first person perspective he's very consistent in how he refers to them whereas in name of the wind uh both will switch what name he's referring to people as um like this is more obvious with like his, his friend group uh when he's in like his university arc uh like he has like sim and simon and he'll like switch back and forth between referring to them and like sometimes in dialogue he'll call them one name and then in in um like his his like own internal dialogue as he's turning like telling the story he'll refer to them as a different name and it like it goes back and forth and it it just makes it harder to follow uh it makes it really messy in the end this book is not even worth one star but if you want to talk to me about books uh please feel free to join my discord server or follow me on twitter um or on twitch I do stream every Monday, Tuesday morning, as well as Thursday, Friday night. Uh, most of the time it is art streams. But yeah, thank you for watching and I'll see you guys next time.